Welcome to Bitcoin Center Radio, recorded live from downtown Miami's expanding business district. How's it going, guys? I'm sure you all are familiar with me. Very excited to bring you an uh, emergency broadcast here. Four days out from the halving and Bitcoin has been knocking on 10K's door. So we definitely wanted to bring you guys some content uh, on these exciting times. And the three of you guys, thank you so much uh, for joining us for this special emergency live broadcast of our podcast. But if you each want to introduce yourselves and just let the people know who you are, that'd be great. Thanks again. So Ty, go ahead. You can go first. Sure. I, uh, my name is Ty Blackard. I'm otherwise known as Titan Inc. on Twitter. I'm the COO of FOMO Hunt. Um, you know, we're building wealth tech for uh, digital assets um, and commodities and assets in general. So just been doing blockchain since 2018 and uh, happy to be here. Okay. And Alexandra, we love to have lovely ladies on this chat. Alexandra is actually part of my toxic ladies chat, which is a great group in itself of amazing women in blockchain technology. Uh, so Alexandra, go ahead. Sure. So I'm Alexandra. Uh, I usually go by Alexandra933 on most platforms. Pseudonymous, I suppose, but everyone knows my last name. It's out there. I am the co-host or I guess primary host for uh, Advanced Tech Podcast. And we talk to people creating the tech of tomorrow. So it's not just Bitcoin. When we talk cryptocurrency, it is Bitcoin, but it's things such as artificial intelligence, emerging tech, you know, augmented and virtual reality, various other things and people that have created some of the cool platforms from the beginning. I also wanted to shout out that I'm part of Team Satoshi, the upcoming Havanine Challenge uh, or Fitness Challenge. So that'll be really cool. You can see my Twitter for that. And I'm also part of the Value of Bitcoin conference. I'm moderating a Hacking Bitcoin panel on the 12th. And uh, go ahead, Daniel. Yeah, I'm Daniel Amelli, longtime Bitcoiner. And uh, even before that, I you know kept waiting for them to invent it. I do my own um, trading in the cryptocurrency market and previously traded the futures and, and bonds and stocks and options. And uh, I'm currently teaching online classes about Bitcoin, Ethereum and cryptocurrency trading. And I really appreciate everything, you know, the Bitcoin Center in, uh, in New York and Miami do. Looking forward to visiting people in person again. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Daniel comes down to Miami and hangs out with us sometimes. So he knows how fun it is here. Thanks, Dan. So yeah, I mean, let's let's just address the the elephant in the room, guys. Uh, the having now four days away. I think we might be below uh, six hundred blocks to go. Yep, five hundred and ninety four blocks to go. Some incredible volume coming through today. Definitely good to see the volume picking up with the attempt for ten k. Haven't broken over ten k yet. I think the high we hit was ninety nine seventy. Yeah, so super close. only thirty dollars off. Ty, if, if you want to pull up some charts and sure. hear what you're thinking with, with all this, I would definitely love to hear your take on everything, man. Okay. So I, what we'll do is we'll just kind of, uh, we'll take a, a more macro look and, and kind of come in. I'll try to um, expand this to, to focus on what we need to focus on. So the, the main price levels, you know, that we're looking at right now, you know, obviously currently we're right at 90, about 9,800. So the big problem is we are getting really overbought on the RSI. And so if you're not familiar with the RSI, it's relative strength index. Best way to describe it is, is basically it, it tells you when uh, too many people or, or the price is going up too fast, essentially. Um, it, it becomes too parabolic. So we're not, you know, um, we're actually very familiar with, you know, parabolic price rises with Bitcoin. It's not a new thing, but, uh, you know, in, in markets in general, it's not necessarily a good thing. But, you know, I, I don't think anybody is going to be, you know, have a problem with that. So uh, with that being said, uh, on the weekly, uh, we're not quite overbought yet, but we are looking at we, we just passed over a, a big pr uh, price level, uh, which is about nine thousand six hundred. So we passed through that resistance, you know, pretty easily. The next price resistance is going to be about 10,200. In between uh, 9,600 and 10,200, there's really not a whole lot of resistance, to be honest, which is probably why Bitcoin has been able to you know, pass through um, so quickly uh, at this point. And just to come back down to the daily. So the daily is where things get a little interesting because 
you know, as we just noted, there there isn't a whole lot of resistance between 9,600 and 10,200. However, uh, like I just mentioned, the, the daily RSI is so overbought, it's not even funny. So what this means is that we're probably going to have to see some type of uh, retrace very soon. If we did see a retrace, uh, which I, I, it's very likely that we see a retrace either, you know, obviously today or tomorrow, then we'd probably be looking at that 9,600 price level. Uh, if 9,600 does not hold up, then we would probably be looking at around 9,200. Uh, after that, I don't see Bitcoin, well, I don't see Bitcoin crashing past 9,200 until possibly after the halving, but that's where the conversation would start to change because then you have to start talking about, you know, mining operations. Are they going to start offloading their Bitcoin? But, you know, we can get into a conversation about Tether and uh, packs being minted and, and, uh, and, you know, of course, printed off essentially and see if that's going to make an impact. And I have some interesting theories about that if you guys want to hear about that later. But uh, essentially, these are the, the main price levels. After that, I mean, after 10,200, you have, you know, 11,500 and then 13,000. And then, you know, after that, it's, you know, home free. Uh, pretty much between 13,000 and 20,000, it's, uh, it's kind of thin. There's not a whole lot of price history there. So we could just blow right past the 20K and beyond. But we really have to get past uh, the, the biggest price levels are 11,500 and 13,000. But at the moment, we're on the way to 10,200, no problem. So. so potential for clear skies ahead. But the thing I've been looking at is these cell walls popping up uh, around the 10K level. We know that 10K is a huge psychological barrier. Also, that's kind of where the MSM... FOMO really kicks in when MSNBC loves to, to scream. It looks like there's an $11.7 million sell wall at 10000 on BitMEX and a $3.3 million sell wall on Coinbase at 10000 as well. So, I mean, those walls could be fake, um, but I think we know that 10000 is an extreme psychological barrier for us to get over. So, I mean, do you think realistically we could, we could break through that before the halving? It's very possible. And this is, okay, I guess I can get into the whole tether thing now and I'll go ahead and show my screen again so I can show you what I'm referring to. So let's show you the tweets here. Um, so, so if you're not familiar with like the, you know, tether being minted, um, and, you know, the Tether being moved from the, the Tether Treasury to, to you know, uh, exchange wallets and whatnot. You know, 2017, you know, there's a lot of speculation that, uh, you know, the reason for the Bitcoin price being able to, to push to 20K was because of the Tether printing. So uh, lately, you know, in the last two weeks, we've had, um, you know, a massive amount of Tether dollars being printed and then moved off of those um off of the treasury to, to unknown wallets. Now this could be like exchange wallets. It could just be, it's more than likely exchange wallets, but, but we don't know for sure, unless you of course, you know, trace the addresses yourself. But what this could mean, and this is obviously interesting timing, by the way, you know, where we're going into the halving and, uh, you know, these tether, tether dollars are being printed. Now, you know, my theory behind this is there could be possible collaboration between the mining operations and, uh, you know, Bitfinex. And by the way, you know, PAX is also a part of this as well. So they printed off 7 million. And I think the numbers are, I think, over $300 million uh, in Tether printed so far. It could be more than that. But basically, the theory is that there could be some collaboration between mining operations and, and Tether being printed off. Of course, there's never been like an, a, a real official audit for Tether. So, you know, is the money actually there or not? I mean, nobody really knows. But if, if it's possible that, you know, these Tether dollars are being used to print, you know, new, I'm uh, sorry, to, to push the price of Bitcoin past certain price levels, you know, going into the halving so that these mining operations don't have to sell off as much as they normally would, because keep in mind, their profits are going to essentially be cut in half, you know, in an instant. So that's kind of my theory there. Yeah. So the theory of things being cut in half, right? That is kind of what makes this exciting. It's the supply and demand curve. The supply is being decreased. And what's beautiful about Bitcoin is that the miners and the people that are, that are ver verifying the Bitcoin blockchain, they know, and they've known that this is going to happen. So they're preparing for it. Now, Daniel, uh, what do you think about that? Just the relationship between, between 
the fact that miners are now getting half of the rewards that they are used to getting. Well, in a perfect world, uh, Bitcoin's production would be continuously declining instead of the having events. As much as I enjoy the celebration and the excitement and the attention that it brings, the havings are a, a point where Bitcoin could be attacked. Each one is a risk, especially um, until we have a significant stable fee revenue. Right now, you know, Bitcoin is the best positioned of, of any uh, cryptocurrency to have, you know, uh, enough fee revenue to support its own security, but it's still not there yet. And even if people are willing to pay it, when you see things like fees going between, you know, one penny and several dollars and then back and back, it's not great for miners trying to figure out, you know, how much they should be investing in mining operations. But as for miners getting their revenues cut in half, I mean, th this should be a known event for them. You know, it, should, it shouldn't be something that they're surprised by at this point. But I think for a lot of miners, they're still looking at it in terms of how many dollars out are they getting for how many dollars they put in. And um, all Bitcoin has to do is double in price for the, the having to be a complete non-event from their perspective. And uh, what we saw from the last two halvings was that it, you know, went up far more than double in price. So, uh, you know, right around a halving would be actually a great time for a lot of people to get into mining in terms of their uh, profitability over the next year or two. The other thing is, right, there's a lot of people who are mining who aren't talking about it because they don't need to talk about it. The beautiful thing about mining is it's, it's like the old, uh, you know, joke uh, we used to talk about when I was hanging out with, uh, you know, non-cryptocurrency traders. We're like, yeah, we just need a magic box. You just plug it into the wall and it makes money. Then you don't have to do anything. Easy. Well, you know, things are never as easy in practice as you, you might fantasize. But the reality is you can mine, which is that, you know, you run your warehouse and you don't have to talk to the media. You don't have to have, you know, the press coming in and going. It doesn't need to be inspected. Although, you know, some governments are talking about a license for mining. You do not need a license to mine. It's, it's fairly uh, it's fairly discreet. Uh, it can be in you know, very remote places. Yeah. So um, so I think there's a lot of people mining because uh, they want to or because they they don't mind mining at a loss or they have the access to free electricity. and They don't care to mention it to other people um, or because that's the best way for them to try to get a certain amount of money outside of their country could be things like that. I don't, you know, I think some people, again, that are looking for it in terms of, you know, in terms of dollars and dollars out, there's people in terms of other things. And there's people that just have really good deals on electricity. So they're going to keep going for it. And then there's also people who want to accumulate as many Bitcoins as they can because they believe in it for the long term. So again, if some miners drop off, you know, the difficulty just adjusts down. We still have a decent security budget for Bitcoin and uh, it can continue. Where I get scared is, you know, again, if you had a large sustained price decrease, then that could lead to a lot of miners being for sale, which could let an attacker potentially buy them off. Um, I just I want to say about Tether, you know, Tether originally said that they were fully backed by dollars. Then they said, OK, well, we're 70 percent backed by dollars and other, you know, similar uh, securities. Um, and there's really no reason to take their word for any of this stuff. I think it's worth assuming in your, your models that uh, Tether will fail spectacularly at some point. There's also a pretty yeah. decent chance of certain other stable coins uh, blowing up. Whether, you know, I, I happen to like the stable coins because I think they created a way for people to make decentralized exchanges so we can get away from centralized exchanges. And eventually we'll have some kind of stable coin that isn't, doesn't have all these problems that the existing ones do. But yeah, if Tether blows up, that would definitely hurt the price. You know, you could have another thing like March 12th. But as we saw, we we came back from that. The price dropped by 50% in one day, and those losses are already gone. So definitely, I want to get back, touch back on the topic of Tether, uh, but I do want to ask Alexandra, what do you think in terms of what's going to happen with the Bitcoin price post -hack? I mean, that's a, always a good question if I had a crystal ball. <laughs> I believe strongly in Bitcoin, so I think it's been relatively stable for the last year. I got into Bitcoin in 2017, uh, a little bit before the, uh, I guess, with the big price spike. So August, something like that. Uh, so this is actually my first halving. So I've yet to experience what happens to price uh, during and halving. But uh, we'll see. I think long term, it's got all the potential. I mean, right now, if you look at what's happening with the halving or the halving, it is essentially you've got fiat, which is quantitative Easing. You've got all of this happening, going on, all this money printing. And right now with the having or the having, you've got quantitative hardening, if you will, which is, you know, our money just gets harder and harder. 
and the fact that we've got a fixed supply. If you look at the fundamentals of Bitcoin, I think, I mean, it's a no-brainer to me. Uh, to me, it's not about the price. It's about the fact that it's an actual fair currency for probably the first time that we've seen in a very, very long time. No, that completely makes sense to me too. It's like really what rather what happens with price. Not saying that Bitcoin's going to go to $200, but if it did, I feel like that would be very good in the long run. So do you guys think, and we'll start in the circle again, Ty, Daniel, and Alexandra, do you guys think that it's already quote unquote priced in? I would say definitely not because again, go, go out in the street, standing six feet away and ask a hundred strangers if the having is priced in. And what you're going to get is 99 what? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah. So again, the efficient market hypothesis is assuming that people have access to all the information and clearly they don't. Right. The the pool of potential people who might buy Bitcoin is way, way, way bigger than the pool of people who do own Bitcoin or even have an account already open with which they could buy Bitcoin with one click. So there's a, a lot of people who are going to be surprised by this. There's a lot of people who unfortunately will decide to start buying when they hear about it on the mainstream news, which is usually not the right time to get in. But there's, there's, nothing that, there's nothing I can do about that besides try to tell as many people myself now before the, the hype gets to its uh, maximum peak. So in terms of the, the thing is even, OK, even among the people who know about it, right, they could say, OK, I think the having will make the price go up. So I'm going to go all in now. Well, if I go all in now, how much is the price going up? Me personally going all in, right? If I think after the having the price will go to 50,000. If I just buy as many Bitcoin as I can now, that doesn't make the price go to fifty thousand, right? I'm not I'm not a billionaire, so so I'm among, among the people who believe in Bitcoin, you know, even if they all go all in, it's not necessarily going to move the price up to that. Also, as I mentioned, with having, there's still a risk, right? There's a risk that there could be an attack. There's a risk that it won't go through the rate. Even if you think this having is priced in, are all the subsequent having priced in, or at what point? Does the having become priced in? Because you know they certainly weren't priced in from the beginning. The uh, you know we just thought would say with uh, Paul Tudor getting Bitcoin, and those are the you know people who might be able to actually push the thing to where it should be. But again, people do even people even have an idea of where it should be. So if you know if uh, you get a lot of smart rich people together in a room and say, okay, where should the having move the price to? You're going to get all different answers. Maybe some people think that should move it up 20%. Some say it would double it. And some say, no, that's good for 50 Yeah. Yeah. Really good point, Daniel. In terms of, in terms of uh, the, what you said, the efficient market theory, there are so many people who just own Bitcoin because they thought it was a good investment and are holding on to it. So they don't actually, like, they don't know that this stuff is happening. They're not buying, selling, or trading. So markets are not efficient. Now, Ty, what, what do you think? Do you think that is quote unquote priced in? Well, I would say, okay, so we have an example of like Black Thursday. I think that's what pe most people are calling it now, uh, where, you know, the, the price absolutely collapsed. Now, I don't, I don't know why it collapsed. I, think, I don't think anybody knows. But what we do know is that since that collapse, I mean, the price has pretty much from the very bottom, it has rose 150% in a very, very short amount of time. And... This could be because uh, it's, it's trying to get back to the mean value of what Bitcoin is actually worth. The other thing is Bitcoin mining operations have pretty much kicked it into like second gear, or actually like you know, fifth gear, trying to, to prepare for this happening. So they're trying to get as much Bitcoin as possible before, of course, their profits get cut in half because it, it literally gets cut in half within one block, uh, 10 minutes. <laughs> so uh, so I, I would say probably not. I would also say uh, you know, it, is the dollar, uh, you know, is a dollar losing supply? Absolutely not. I mean, we're, we're adding, um, you know, trillions of U.S. dollars all the time. So I think what's happening is you have essentially what's happening is Bitcoin is trying to, to get back to its real value. And I don't think its real value is under $10,000 personally. I think its real value is somewhere between, uh, at least for now, somewhere between ten and $20,000. But after the halving, what is it worth then? Because not, not only do you have, uh, you know, the, the supply, incoming supply cut in half, but, but that also means the inflation rate is now going to be less than, than the 2% target for most central banks, you know, for their fiat currency. Because you're going to be looking at like 1.9 around there. 
as opposed to what it is right now, which is I'm looking at right now, it's like 3.82%. So for the first time in history, we're going to see Bitcoin's inflation rate below 2% which again is the, is the target for most central banks. So I don't think the, the halving's priced in. And like Daniel said, I mean, does anybody even, like if you ask 99 people, you know, out of 100, would, would most of them know even what the halving is? Absolutely not. So that's my personal opinion. Yeah, for sure. And, and Alexandria, I just want to, Alexandria, I want to bring it back to you because you definitely, you know, touched on earlier the fact that the Federal Reserve is printing so much money right now, right? So that's super dangerous for us. So. <laughs> Do you think from your perspective, is the having priced in? It's tough to say. I think anytime you're speculating about currency, it could go up, it could go down. Don't throw everything you've got into it. And one of the best ways to get into Bitcoin is to buy a few sats at a time or a dollar cost average. There's a number of apps. I think Amber is one and there's a few others that are, are good for dollar cost averaging. You can also look at ways to hook up things like Fold.app uh, and just kind of passively earn Bitcoin. I think definitely understand a little bit or a lot about it before investing any significant money. And just remember, it's like anything. It could go up, it could go down. Do you guys hear my sound okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. All right. Yep. Just went really quiet there for a minute. <laughs> so I don't know. It. Um, I guess we'll, we'll see what happens. I mean, I think right now we have an incredible buy-in opportunity. So, you know, if you are, if you believe in Bitcoin, if you understand where the price probably should be, and if you understand its true intrinsic value, look at that. And, you know, maybe, maybe put in some sats or maybe buy some sats, exchange your, your fiat money that uh, could be worth not very much. I think personally, the U.S. dollar is always going to be around. My friend Hass has a, a good way of putting it. The U.S. dollar is, is not backed by anything but the U.S. military. So that's a pretty strong backing. So I think it's always going to be around. It is the world reserve currency uh, where Bitcoin will be priced in relative to the U.S. dollar. It's, it's too soon to say. Uh, I mean, it's only been around for 11 years. So we're new. We're very new to the game. I think we should all take advantage of this opportunity that we, you know, we do see the value in it. And uh, if you do see value in it, throw 10 bucks at it and see what happens. Dollar cost average for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's crazy to think Bitcoin's only been around 11 years. Mm -hmm. This is, we're approaching the third halving. This has only happened twice before prior. So the next question I want to ask you three is, just how different are things today in 2020 versus the last halving, which was on July 8, 2016? And, you know, I know a ton of people got in around 2017, you know, when the price ran up to 20K. But for a lot of people, this is the, the first halving that they're ever going to experience. So I think that's an interesting question to look at, you know, where were we four years ago and where are we at today? You know, is there different institutional levels of interest? Are even the normies and Main Street investors more interested in that? But uh, Ty, if you want to kick it off with that. Sure. I mean, well, well, first of all, you know, 2000, 2017, or sorry, 2016, 2017, uh, you know, obviously there was, there was massive, uh, you know, mainstream coverage. And this was probably, um, I mean, this is probably one of the reasons why a lot of us are, are here for the most part. You know, when, when we were first exposed to, uh, you know, the, the crazy price increase um, for Bitcoin, you know, I, I think that I think Bitcoin is, you know, from, from previous halvings, you know, it, it approached like, for, for instance, like if we go back to like 2015 at the halving, it, it took around 189 days, uh, you know, until after the halving to break the previous all time high. For this case, I mean, you have people like Paul Tudor Jones, you know, getting involved. I mean, I, I don't think that it's an accident that, you know, people like him and, and obviously institutions. I think, uh, Erica, you mentioned like Fidelity just listed Bitcoin or, or, or something of that nature um, on your Instagram. So I, th I think institutions are obviously taking this seriously. They obviously realize that, that you know, the, the money supply, the fiat money supply is, is not getting any, any lesser and like Paul Tudor Jones said, I mean, you know, Bitcoin reminds him of the of gold in the 70s. And, you know, we, we have this moment in time with, you know, coronavirus and, and unemployment, et cetera. And, and, you know, obviously unemployment could could be a factor in, in Bitcoin sell-off in the future. We don't know. But what we do know is that this particular scenario has never happened. You know, Bitcoin was created in a financial crisis, uh, you know, in, in 2008, 2009. But it's never had to to kind of uh, show off its ability in a financial crisis. So now it has the opportunity to do so. 
And uh, we're going to find out uh, if it's the real deal or not. <laughs> it seems to be so far. <laughs> No, very much so. It's like Bitcoin was made for this, right? Bitcoin was made as a form of money that's outside of the control of governments. Japan right now, they used to have caps on how many bonds they could buy back. I think it was like $80 billion. Like what cap is that? But regardless, they completely got rid of it, right? So just to comment on what you said, the, the story that I posted on my Instagram was actually a, a repost from a year ago. So a year ago, Fidelity started putting, they, they started doing Bitcoin custody. Fidelity has, Fidelity has also been mining Bitcoin since 2013. So um, definitely you're right in saying that the on-ramps, the backs, right? They didn't exist the last two halvings. They do now. The, the on-ramps for institutional money to get in and get in quickly is, is here before. And so we, I mean, it's only happened twice. Let's see what happens. So D Daniel, what about you? What do you think? Why don't we ask the question, Matt? Sure. Yeah. So we're specifically looking from today, 2020, to the last time the halving occurred, which was July 8, 2016. So just looking at how the current macro environment is different and also how the current Bitcoin environment is different as well versus four years ago today. Well, this is the third halving for me. But I would say, you know, even though the, the general public is still unaware of it, at least, uh, you know, there, there's people I can talk to about it for this one. Certainly it was... Uh, really obscure you know uh, for the, the prior two but I, I you know i expect that it'll be something similar to the last two in that uh it's not really going to be that anticipated prior to the having and then after the having you just simply have a change in the supply which causes the price to slowly find a new equilibrium assuming demand stays roughly the same or, or grows at a moderate pace so you know the interesting thing happens you know after over time and then a slow rise leads into the the parabolic run but just because the having isn't isn't priced in doesn't mean it will go up because it's possible for the the having to be so anticipated in advance that it still goes down afterwards um that's what we've seen you know leading up to like litecoin havings where there's really not a, a huge amount of uh you know a litecoin economy to really support that so again you know people get so excited in advance pushes the price up too much I would say this, I think, you know, um, Bitcoin can appeal to non-rich people who think, oh, wow, this could make me rich. And then for rich people, they're thinking, how do I stay rich? And uh, Bitcoin hasn't been appealing to the that crowd yet. But I think in light of the recent actions of different central banks, they, they are genuinely worried. You know, if they were thinking, wow, I have a billion dollars, you know, I'll never be able to spend this amount of money in my lifetime, no matter what I do. And then, you know, if the people are talking about, hey, we're going to have a wealth tax, we're going to have negative interest rates, we're going to print trillions of dollars, they really do start to worry, you know, is that billion dollars going to buy me a loaf of bread in the future? You know, well, what, what can I do? And uh, putting a, you know, a very tiny as a percentage of their, you know, funds into Bitcoin starts to look more reasonable. Yeah, definitely the argument right now is being made in, in pretty high circles that Bitcoin is good because it has a limited supply. And a lot of people say, and you know, no country is immune to hyperinflation, but they say, some, like especially in Venezuela, Bitcoin is not about getting rich, it's about not getting poor, right? Fact. So Alexandra, I know that you said that this is your first having around, uh, but just in your experience, do you think that there's any differences between the having that happened in 2016 and the having that's happening now? To be honest, I don't know too much about it. Uh, as mentioned, I wasn't uh, I wasn't around for that. I probably should have researched this a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> All good. I think if you look at uh, at Bitcoin and again for the fundamentals, you're starting to see a lot of smart money come into Bitcoin and quietly, which is very interesting. You're not going to see people that are truly, truly interested that have the you know the vast capital to put into it um, announce it. Nobody's going to do that. That uh, could really significantly affect the price. I don't believe so anyway. I know I've had a lot of friends that invest that are looking to, you know, they're like, okay, I think I'm finally interested in Bitcoin. How do I get into Bitcoin? Um, and they don't want to just buy a Bitcoin. They want to buy a few Bitcoins. So that's a significant enough investment that, you know, the most important thing is to really understand. And I think the, the fact that Bitcoin has stayed around, it's not just been, you know, a blip. It's not been something that, you know, was tried for a couple of years and then failed. I think the fact that, you know, Bitcoin exists and it's, um, it's been, you know, sure, it was volatile at the beginning, but now that it's got so much, uh, so much power backing it, I think it's, it's very, 
you know, it's a bit of an existential threat for traditional finance. So uh, I think even the harshest critics of Bitcoin, uh, even the ones that say, you know, I'm never going to get into it, I I'm willing to bet they're probably doing their research. Yeah, I mean, definitely listen to the what the woman says. They are coming in and they are coming in quietly. It is not reflected on Coinbase right now. It is not reflected on any of the charts. So uh, we're going to talk about a stock to flow ratio. Got to got to bring up stock to flow for the last question here. Sorry that the image was popping up there. So uh, the final question I have for you three is, do you believe in the stock to flow model? Do you think it's overhyped? I mean, when you actually zoom out and bring it all the way back, you know, to, to the Genesis block and the past two halvings, I mean, there's definitely some merit um, to the stock to flow model. Uh, the price is almost, it hasn't perfectly mirrored, you know, what the stock to flow model predicts, but it does a pretty damn good job uh, of sticking relatively close to it. And I think Ty brought it up after the next halving, um, Bitcoin stock to flow ratio pretty much, uh, it's not exactly on par with gold, but it'll, it'll be under 2%. So I just want to know if you guys think there's merit to this argument, if you believe in the predictions that, you know, we're going to see prices nearing 100K in a few years after the halving. I, I just want to get your, your thoughts on that because, you know, as we get closer to the halving, everyone's kind of going crazy uh, right now picking apart the stock to flow model. And Dan, I, I, I did see the, the medium post a few, I think a few days or a few weeks ago about the limitations to it, but uh, just want to get everyone's take on that real quick. Well, I will tell you that, uh, you know, personally, I, I honestly haven't done much research on the stock to flow model. <laughs> so I'm probably not the best guy for it. So Alexandra, are you familiar with stock to flow at all? I'm actually not. Would it be a good time to maybe explain what stock to flow is for your listeners that, that aren't as well? Yeah, probably a good good idea. I do know that this this model. Uh, I know who who created or, or or talks about it a lot. It's uh, what's his name? Like Plan B or uh, something like that on Twitter. I definitely should research more on it though. Uh, four days from now, that'll be cut in half to six point two five, and then it's the ratio of that to the existing supply. Uh, right now, I think we're at what eighteen point three. Maybe 18,350,000 Bitcoins, uh, I want to say. We should be somewhere around there. It's the relationship between how many Bitcoins are in circulation and the production to the cost. So people are saying, you know, one example that people are saying is that imagine if the gold rush was happening right now, people are mining for gold, and about half of the people that were mining for gold just left the market. That would increase uh, it would keep the demand the same, but it would decrease the supply, therefore making price go up, right? So uh, you can read right. that. Yeah. Is this also accounting for uh, the lost Bitcoins that, you know, we, we assume, you know, like an estimate was, would probably be somewhere around like 17, 16 million. Is this accounting for that? I don't think it does account for it. And that's a good point because, I mean, most recent estimates that I've seen is that at least three to four million on the low end. Um, are lost forever, you know, just from people forgetting their password, throwing away their private keys. The poor guy, I think he was in London or somewhere in the UK, all his Bitcoins and, and hard drives in the dumpster. But then there's also a million coins, right, that uh, haven't moved, that are Satoshi's coins. And Craig Wright claim, <laughs> claims they're, they're his, but uh, more like Craig Wrong, <laughs> in my opinion. But yeah, I mean, you're looking at low end, 4 million to 5 possibly upwards of, of 6 million Bitcoins just gone forever that uh, will never be accessed. So I think a lot of people forget that that's like yeah. one third of the, of the supply is yeah. gone for good. I mean, there, the website that I had on the screen, one in 21 million, you know, there's only 21 million Bitcoins that'll ever be created. There's 40, there's over 42 millionaires on the planet. Even if every millionaire wanted one, they'd only be able to get, you know, about a half. So, yeah. which is why we go to a point eight out to the, to the right decimal yeah. of Satoshi's. That's why Satoshi's <laughs> are Satoshi's because we definitely need to measure our wealth a little bit differently. I think that it's $83 trillion right now is the goal is the world's like, like supply of money in total, including everything. So. Last question for you guys. Price predictions. Now, obviously, this is not financial <laughs> advice to anybody that's listening. This is just our prediction. Please, please 
don't get us in trouble. Um, but let's say price prediction of what Bitcoin will be before the halving, directly after the halving, and then let's say one year from now, so May 2021. All right, uh, I guess I'll go first. Uh, price before halving, I would probably say, this is a good one. I mean, we have like, what, four days? Uh, I would probably say, I would say somewhere around 10,200. I think that's a safe bet. After having, I do think we, I do think we'll, we will probably retrace just a bit. I don't think it's going to be nearly as bad as it was uh, in 2016. So I would probably say after having maybe, maybe 9,000, 8,500. Those are some pretty decent price levels. A uh, year into the future, oh, I would, I would say upwards of $100,000 for sure. Let's go, big facts. <laughs> Alexander? I'm going to say uh, right before the halving, we'll probably hit like, I don't know, I'd say 9.8 is probably fairly realistic. After the halving, I'd say somewhere between, and this is complete conjecture. This is just what, from what, I, what I've seen, just looking at different charts. Probably 7,200 to 9,000. I definitely think it'll dip. And I think a year from now, I don't think we're going to see 100,000. Um, I do think we'll see that eventually. But I'd say we're probably somewhere between 17 and 20,000, maybe 22. Gotcha. Cool. Really cool, Alexandra. Thank you. Now, Daniel, wonderful. You were able to join us again. Sorry, we had to miss that stock to flow question. We probably are going to have you on a podcast in the future. Maybe each of you individually. I think you have really interesting aspects that we can touch on. But the question, last question before we go is price prediction. We did the disclaimers. This is not financial advice. Price prediction right before the halving, directly after the halving occurs, and then um, a year from now, so May 2021. Yeah, I mean, my, my price prediction was that we would be getting close to the all-time high by the time of the halving. Uh, so we still need to go up another 70% or so. Um, you know, we have five days. Anything's possible. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, Bitcoin is, is going to go into the six-figure range. Um, but again, was that going to happen, you know, this year, in next year, or, you know, five years from now? Uh, I don't I don't know. I don't have that exact timeline. Sometimes, you know, things are just lined up, you know? Like, you can see that there's a lot of, you know, fresh snow on a steep mountain and the you know, avalanche is going to happen sooner or later and if you try to predict the exact timing you know you're just trying to get points basically uh, so it, all, all the pieces are aligned basically for, for bitcoin to go really high and i think it's a matter of time of course yeah i tell people yeah it's not financial advice uh but it is life advice and uh and i and i think if someone is using it i mean as, as alexandra mentioned right use bold app or if you use lolly or something that gives you um, now that someone's launching, you know, they're launching a card that gives you a uh, Bitcoin back. I mean, if you're not even putting money in, but you're getting a little Bitcoin out, you know, what's the worst that could happen? There's really no, there's really no downside there. Just like, uh, you know, back in the day, there, were, there was an actual faucet that was giving out people uh, five Bitcoin, you know, if they clicked on, clicked on and filled out the CAPTCHA or whatever, uh, that kind of thing. It's like, it's a, you know, heads you win, tails, absolutely nothing happens. So I don't see the downside there. It's a very asymmetric bet. And I think, you know, the same thing applies to someone who's very rich putting in a mere $100,000. Absolutely. Yeah. Personally, I think if we could get over the psychological barrier of 10 k um, there's no reason we shouldn't be able to push to 11.5 or 12 k uh, Post having, we're definitely going to see a correction. Uh, I think at least retesting maybe 8.8 .8 or 8,000, hopefully not back to 6 or 7 k but Definitely a possibility. Uh, and then a year from now, definitely as the macro environment continues to go uh, in the absolute shitter, the Fed printing $125 billion a day, now we're borrowing $3 trillion with a T, trillion dollars, um, and basically doubling the monetary supply uh, mm -hmm. in a matter of months. There's absolutely no reason that Bitcoin will not be at six figures. Um, uh, a year from now. Is it going to happen the day after the halving? Of course not, but we're in this for the long haul, guys. Uh, like we said earlier, Bitcoin's not a get rich quick scheme. It's a don't go poor slowly exactly. scheme. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Oh.
hoarding cash right now, you're literally losing more and more. What, two, two, three percent, maybe more now? Who knows? Absolutely. And I, I forget the exact Twitter handle, but someone made a Twitter account showing if you had put in your $1,200 Trump bucks <laughs> into Bitcoin, what it would be worth today. And as of yesterday, it was like 15 75 or something. So definitely can't wait to keep an eye on that. But uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in to this emergency broadcast of the Bitcoin Center Miami uh, radio. This will be available on YouTube, SoundCloud, Apple Music, Spotify, basically anywhere. A big shout out to the Podtex team. Super excited to be partnered up with them. If you guys are interested in learning about the podcast resources we have available, Or if you're interested in having your own podcast, check out podtext.com backslash Miami. But thank you guys again so much for tuning in. I know we'll all be glued to the charts over these next four days. So might have to tune back in on the actual day of the having. But thanks again, guys, and stay safe out there. Happy trading. Bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Thank you. Strategically located in downtown Miami's emerging business district, the Blockchain Center is the premier hub of the Americas for teaching, networking, and building the distributed future. Our mission is to manifest the mass adoption of blockchain technology and onboard the next 6 billion people to the global monetary revolution.